It's a pleasure to have all of you and our guest of honor. We are rounding out our series with the service secretaries after coming off our series with the, the Joint Chiefs last year. And I really can't think of any better way to end it. It's like a cherry on the Sunday with Secretary McHugh because he will re be able to sit with us and reflect upon his service and basically in the entirety of the Obama administration to date as on the eve of his retirement from not just the Defense Department, but from government service. He's a true, true civil servant in every respect. And he's been a, an unsung hero uh, for the Army and the soldiers that are in it forever, not just in his capacity in the executive branch, but during his long tenure in the House of Representatives, nine-term member from upstate New York, West Point Board of Visitors, and many, many other roles and commissions and responsibilities he's held in the last 40 years, as we were just discussing. So I, uh, I'm in awe and honored to host him and, and, and pleased to have him here and to welcome all of you. Uh, we'll, we'll be live tweeting parts of this with hashtag McHugh at AEI. And uh, I'm not going to give much more introduction of him beyond that, because I know you know him well enough to, to have shown up to be here today. So Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thank you for thank coming. You. Thank, thank you for being here. Good to be here. It's a pleasure to, to sit and talk and uh, learn about not just what's next for you, which I hope we'll get to eventually, but, but talk a little more about um, looking back a little bit for a moment. And then we will open it up for questions and answers and get, at, get you all out of here on time. There's been a lot of things. I mean, when we think back what the Army was dealing with six years ago and what you're talking and thinking about today, it's been a wild ride. You've dealt with some significant challenges. Yeah, I arrived where things were uh, very, very painful, two theaters of war. But they were more settled in that we knew pretty much where the challenges lied. Uh, we knew pretty much what our missions were going to be. Uh, thought we knew who our friends and our less friendly uh, opponents were, but uh, as you as you noted, things have a habit of uh, turning around on you. And I think if you look at the last 20 months, particularly, uh, certainly from the Army perspective, uh, we're dealing with a menu of, of missions and challenges that were largely unforeseen. Uh, even Ebola in West Africa, we hadn't really thought about the United States Army going and being kind of the foundational force there to deal with that challenge and to contain it, but we were called upon, we did it. Uh, ISIL obviously uh, was not uh, the kind of force and challenge that it is today. Uh, the activities in Eastern Europe, uh, the adventurism as I call it, was not uh, on our plate directly, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the good news is, as they always have been, the men and women that wear that uniform in virtually all ranks have been able to adopt and. Uh, have, have responded. It's, it's been pretty breathtaking to watch from perspective as the secretary. Absolutely. You know, it's um, in some ways, it's a, it's a very high profile and public job. And in other ways, it's, 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 there's a lot of work that you do behind the scenes. And the chief will take the lead. And you have a good relationship, the two of you, and, and who does what. Uh, Usually. You, <laughs> right. Usually. And, um, you know, it's as. Nine years ago, you still had over 100,000 soldiers deployed active duty, roughly. Uh, and while they're in different places now, the tempo still is relatively high for a lot of, of different personnel and service members. It's a challenge because you, know, you, you remember the difficulties with long deployments, one-to-one -one dwell, you know, deploy ratio time, and how challenging that was on people and their families. And then now we have a force uh, more rotational base as opposed to forward, uh, permanently based forward. And at the height of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, it's you know stabilize, take care of your people. And then we switch to this current sort of model, and it's well, nobody wants to be in a garrison force anymore. That's dull and boring. So how do you <laughs> how do you manage the expectations of a changing world and what the army is going to do? That's a critical question, and as you might imagine, I've been asked repeatedly, what keeps you up at night? And there's any number of things, but uh, one of the things I really worry most about is as we transitioned out of the conditions that you described, where virtually every soldier knew at some point or another the likelihood was they were going into a, a combat theater. Uh, some went to Iraq and Afghanistan repeatedly. Uh, they. Uh, 
met incredible challenges. And, and as I went forward, there were 26 trips uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan, including my time in Congress. I was always amazed to see these young lieutenants, captains, out doing things and having the authorities that they probably had to be two or three grades higher, if not more, in conflicts past. And they performed magnificently. And they enjoyed that kind of authority and learned from it. And one of the worst things we can do uh, is to bring leaders like that, soldiers like that, that enjoy getting out and being a soldier. I don't think they enjoy getting shot at, but all the kinds of, of uh, opportunities that going forward somewhere provides and, and boring them to death in garrison, as you noted. So on the one hand, the, the realities of the world are taking care of that for us, whether we like it or not. You mentioned kind of a rotational approach to much of it. We've got 136,000 soldiers right now who are forward stationed, forward deployed, or preparing, preparing to deploy in some 140 locations. So while the world is unsettling to people like me, uh, to our soldiers, it still provides that opportunity to go out and to engage and, and train with other nations, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to begin to do better at home station training we have to make sure, as challenging as our funding may be, that uh, we're maintaining our, our combat training center rotations. Uh, soldiers love to get out into the field and train. Um, and we need to, as well, focus on other things, broadening opportunities like education, partner to partnership uh, uh, opportunities, just uh, trying to do everything we can to make life in uniform of interest and challenge to our soldiers. And uh, nobody likes war, nobody more so than a soldier. Uh, but we do have to be creative in how we keep them excited about being a, a member of the Army team. It's completely challenging. You're, they're going to complain if you're sending them out there, they're going to complain if they're not. But That's not right. in a bad way, in a good way, meaning uh, they want a fulfilling career in, in their service to the country, which I, I respect deeply. So that, that segues perfectly into another um, important shift in priorities, although I would argue that throughout the Obama administration uh, and the team that's been, uh, the civilian and uniform teams at DOD, that there's been a, a focus on people, right? Um, mm -hmm. Civilian DOD and, and uniformed. Uh, more of a longer conversation about diversity, not just diversity in terms of uh, gender or race or religion, but in terms of life experience. I think that's linked partly to Secretary of Defense Ash Carter's and Deputy Secretary's work, work's outreach to Silicon Valley in particular, mm -hmm. and the need to be able to bring people in briefly and kick them back out into the real world, not you know, more lateral entry, more permeability in the system, uh, changes to the up or out promotion, longer time in station, time in, uh, fewer PCSs throughout one's career, um, preferential treatment for duty stations if you're a high performer, you know, a lot of this sort of Holistically, it's being called force of the future, uh, but it's a conversation that's been underway since the last administration, since we had the mm -hmm. National Guard and Reserve Commission led by Arnold Pinaro and others, and there was a discussion of continuum of service. You know it well from your time on the Armed Services <coughs> Committee as ranking member. So while the conversations have been underway for arguably a decade, and there have been some changes like a member of the Guard on the Joint Chiefs uh, and, and some other types of for, uh, compensation changes. This force of the future stuff is hard, this continuum of service model. It's difficult to do. Uh, do you see progress being made in the last 18 months of this administration, or is this something that, because it's executive and legislative branch, uh, they probably have two different definitions of success in this regard. Some of it is internal to DOD, it's DOTMA related, but a lot of it's going to be congressionally approved. Can we make progress? Can there be a big bang approach like a Goldwater Nichols or is this something that's going to take years and, and, and it should? Well, I, I think there's an opportunity here. Uh, as you know, Mackenzie, the first thing you have to have in this city and certainly on Capitol Hill and the Pentagon is, is uh, an agreement that something needs to be done. Sure. And while as in most matters, there are nuanced differences as to both what and then how to do those things between the fun side of the Potomac and the Pentagon, as I call it, <laughs> and on Capitol Hill, uh, there are broader issues of agreement that I think can provide the foundation to, to do some very positive things from now until the close out of this administration. 
And if nothing more, uh, build a solid foundation by which the next administration can continue to work with uh, the next uh, uh, batch of leaders in the, in the Pentagon. The other thing that I think is, is encouraging, and, and you mentioned it, Secretary Carter and Secretary Work, uh, take this very, very seriously. There's a, I think, fairly described pretty aggressive outreach to Silicon Valley. Uh, but the, the challenges, I think, are more broadly based than just what Silicon Valley is, is likely to be able to provide, and, and whether it's cyber, whether it's the emerging technologies that the military knows we're going to have uh, requirements for personnel. Uh, we just have to be more creative. And it's generally couched against us competing as the private sector. Uh, and as you look at how you would come to the military in the past and, and set lengths of tours, et cetera, et cetera, you, you can understand that. So the approach all of us are trying to take is, okay, how can we break that paradigm? And how, most importantly, can we preserve that core force? Because for all of the military, the, the primary responsibility is to be able to go out and defend this nation. But on, on the margins in terms of these uh, highly technological uh, skill sets, uh, we've got to work more cooperatively with the private sector. And I think, I think we're making good progress there. It's hard to point out a cadre of personnel that, that are examples of that. But we offer opportunities, and I'll use cyber as an example, uh, that uh, the private sector can't offer. I mean, we're faced with very highly publicized challenges. The private sector is as well. Uh, but we conduct operations the private sector does not. Uh, though th those provide the opportunity for skill set development that I think in important ways can be of considerable value to the private sector. And we can work better together to make sure that uh, both our interests are better served. So I, I, think, I think there's uh, some real chances there for doing a lot better. Good. I'm encouraged. Your, your colleague, um, the Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, was here and made some headlines. And we'll, Ray can we'll, do that. <laughs> yes, he can. Uh, and he talked at length about the fourth estate and the budget challenges uh, that, that, that you and the chief face, uh, the, the growing money in, that is spent on core business functions and processes of the department, like logistics, like healthcare management, contracting, et cetera, um, in many cases for good reason, right? When you grow the Army in particular, when you grow the force after 9-11 as much as you did, it's understandable that the contractor and the DOD civilian workforces would grow commensurately. The challenge, of course, is, and no one knows this better than the Army, as the active duty force has dropped off pretty precipitously and pretty quickly, in fact, as fast as the Army can do it, I believe, Mm -hmm. uh, we were, there are no commensurate reductions in, in the, the workload and the, the manpower, uh, the DOD civilian manpower. But in the 90s, when you were on the Hill, that is, what, that is the normal flow of things. Uh, we could argue, and I, we wouldn't argue, we would probably agree, that it's probably just best not to take peace dividends when we all think that there's a peace coming that's often elusive. Uh, but in the 90s, once again, when we thought there would, would be one, the active duty force came down about 28%, and the duty civilians followed at 24 But this time around, it's actually inverted, and the Army is dropping uh, like a rock in end strength in active duty terms, and the DOD civilians are roughly flat. In some years, they've gone up. That's a tough challenge. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not doing valuable work. It doesn't mean they're not amazing civil servants. It doesn't mean they're not necessary. So let's put all the caveats aside. Uh, but the Army, institutionally, is looking at some challenges between readiness, of course, the, the three-legged stool, and strength and modernization. And all three are affected by what's happening in the civilian workforce. So what advice would you give your successor uh, on how to think about those priorities? And if there's only enough dollars to fund one or two of them, how do you, how do you order them for risk management in the best way possible for the Army and the nation? I didn't. Uh Take notes on my friend Ray Mabus's comments, but I, you know, for the fourth estate, I think uh, they're finally recognizing the challenge to to reduce their faces, as we say, because as you noted, without that kind of reduction, the workloads don't reduce. Um, the Army, and I'll speak for the Army, is take has taken on the the civilian workforce reduction very aggressively. Uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, ordered us to 
reduce headquarters by 20 percent. I, I up that to 25. Um, that was not without some concern, as you might understand, in the Army halls. Uh, but we're over uh, achieving there. We also, by the way, took that definition of headquarters down to two-star commands and above, which was more broadly based than we were required either by DOD or the Congress. And at the height of the civilian workforce in, in this era of two conflicts of, of war was about 285,000. And that growth occurred not because civilians were standing around saying, we, we want more. It was done so that we could take operational, or I should say generating force soldiers, those who were training, those who were in our schoolhouses, et cetera, et cetera, and put them into operational positions. And we substituted civilians as they went forward. So we've got to rationalize that with the end strike reductions, as you noted. Uh, Congress and, and Senator McCain particularly have been uh, very clear about that. And by the end of 18, we'll in the Army be down to about 233,000 civilian employees. That's a reduction of over 50,000. And I haven't done the exact math, but it's roughly equivalent to the percentage reduction uh, that we have in our end strength as well. We can't do what we need to do as an army, what people think about when they think of armies, without these civilians doing it. And you were very gracious in, in noting that. But we, we do have to be in balance. Mm -hmm. And it would com when it comes to uh, the operational force, you, you, you stated it very correctly. Uh, we're challenged on all three of those right. legs right now, right. frankly. But particularly given the environment that we're seeing across the globe and the likelihood of that next unforeseen thing, which is another matter that keeps me up at night. Uh, readiness has to be our number one concern for the moment. We've managed our, our developmental programs. Uh, we've set aside most of our major acquisition programs for, for large MDEPs, as we call them, major developmental programs until the 2020s and beyond, not because we think that's the best thing to do for our soldiers, but because it's required by this fiscal reality, we're focusing on S&T, uh, looking at things, rather what we, we'd like to have 20 years from now, because we think it may be necessary, uh, and looking at uh, developmental issues where we know we're going to need certain things, particularly for the soldier and the squad better uh, armored systems, reactive armor, uh, better systems for operating in, in degraded visual environments, uh, robotics, uh, UAE, uh, unmanned aer aerial vehicles, UAVs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, better energy programs to both save money but also to lighten the load on our soldiers, uh, diminish the number of convoys that provide an inherent danger getting water and fuel from point A to point B. These are absolutely critical things, no matter what the Army, or what I, sh I should say, what the, the enemy may look like, wherever the enemy may come from. So we've tried to be smarter, but our readiness continues to be a concern for me. Uh, our, our metric is somewhere, and it depends, you can get an argument in the G3, is it 60% or 70%, but I'll leave that question open. But right now we're at about 32, 33% ready and amongst our combat formations. We are consuming that readiness because of those kinds of unforeseen missions that I mentioned as soon as we produce it. And while that's sustainable for a while, uh, as I said, and, and both uh, General Odierno and I, the former chief, uh, have testified repeatedly, if sequestration returns, any meaningful budget reduction in addition to that which we're trying to manage right now, or that next unforeseen thing of any dimension comes forward, uh, we're in a very, very bad place. And uh, I, I've testified, should either of those occur, let alone both, somebody's going to have to ask us to tell us to stop doing something. And, and frankly, as I look at the world right now, I'm not sure what that would be. So this is a critical turning point uh, for the Army and for the Department of Defense, and obviously, logically, uh, for the nation, and uh, while we're, why we are following very carefully what's going up on Capitol Hill. I agree. That uh, was remarkably eloquent, and uh, and I think General O, on his way out the door, made sure to make forceful but respectable comments, but in a way come out swinging uh, to what 
to policymakers as they prepare to think through you know, how to fund the government beyond a series of short-term continuing resolutions. And I think he was right to do that, to lay down a, a really bright red, red line um, in terms of how low end strength can go and readiness, et cetera. Key to the first part of that, your remarks in that last question was, I think, the link that you made between readiness and modernization to get soldiers better energy, uh, better technology, you know, whether that's at the squad level. Uh, it's not just about rotations, right? It's also about what you're providing to them, um, what, they're, what they're driving in, what they're remotely piloting, what they're using on hand, what their weapons and um, munitions are, what they're capable of doing, et cetera. I don't think there's that nuance. Well, I'm, I don't want to pick on the Hill as a, as a block. I think on the policy committees, there's, there is a great understanding of challenges Absolutely. you're facing. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, but it's a, it's a segment of Congress, as you well know. Uh, a, a key statistic I often just surprises me every time I hear it is the majority of Congress, and I mean, we're in the 60, it's somewhere in the 60% range, is, is new to Congress since this administration. So just while you've been secretary, yeah. since you've left the Hill. So if you were to go back, you, you wouldn't know the majority of the faces off. You would know them because of your job, but not from working there, which means the learning curve and the restarts and the education seems to, it's, it's more frequent where, you know, we, we miss the Ike Skeltons and we miss the Carl Levins and we miss the Gene Taylors. We all know the, the old bulls who uh, yep. were around many years with you as well. Uh, so it's a shorter cycle uh, and turnover in the policy space, which makes it, I think, even more difficult um, for a service secretary coming on board. I think the intention's usually in the right place, but they're limited by politics and by the BCA, uh, I think, first and foremost, in a lot of these situations. So putting on your politician hat, you know, just meaning um, if, if, and you don't have to speculate if you don't want to, but uh, if you were on the Hill right now and you were still ranking member, or in this case, you chairman of Armed Services Committee, what would, it, what would you hope for? What would you hope leadership, who doesn't sit on these committees and hear about the day-to-day um, challenges the military is facing. What would you hope, beyond reversing sequestration, would you want them to repeal BCA entirely? Uh, what, is there, what outcomes would you look for? Well, uh, look, um, I'm a recovering politician. I'm not sure where I, where I left my politician's hat, but uh, you, you mentioned this. Uh, we are very, very confident and comfortable with the posture of our oversight committees. Uh, the members understand the plight, understand the nuances. That's why they're on those committees, because the other members want them to be the experts. And, and uh, if you're talking about the, the leadership, particularly uh, Senator Reed, Senator McCain, uh, Mac Thornberry, Adam Smith, and their subcommittee chairmen, uh, I think they're trying to do everything they can to <coughs> help other members, be they of some duration, some tenure or otherwise, to, to understand this. And that's our challenge. If all we had to do was get our committees to, to act, whether it's repealing BCA uh, or some other, uh, other measure, we'd be in far better shape. But that's not how this democracy works. And that's been the challenge. And, and you mentioned, you know, if you talk to any member, most members, uh, they will give due deference to the, the problems we're facing. Um, but in fairness to members, and, and in part this is really a compliment to the United States military, uh, they're not having to deal, thankfully, with a 9-11, or this is not a World War II environment where every person knew somebody who served. These individuals go back, and, and their constituents are worried about you know, their next paycheck. They're worried about the survivability of Social Security, what their children's future is going to be, how's education. And that is what members are focused upon as well. So the challenge, not just for Congress and, and for our leadership and on the oversight committees, but for us through our legislative liaison is to try to help other members and their staffs, because as you know, Mackenzie, the staffs are critical uh, to bring issues to, to members and helping them to understand it um, is our job as well. And I, I mentioned in a forum I was in last week, obviously given the state we've, that we find ourselves in, we, we have not been as successful as we'd like to be. And we're continuing 
those efforts, whether it's a structured one in posture hearings or kind of uh, uh, an opportunity to show our stuff in AUSA, which is coming up in October, uh, or just going to the Hill every single day and trying to meet with PSMs, trying to meet with MLAs, um, and tell them the realities of what we're facing. Uh, we're, we're doing that. But it's obviously, if this were easy, we would have been past this already. Right, right. One of my last questions is, uh, before we open it up, and if they don't ask, I'll keep going, so, uh, is on the Aviation Restructure Initiative. It's, we were briefed on it extensively by the, the brain children of it in the Army, uh, active duty uh, service members, officers. It's, it's, it's remarkably well thought through. It's a great proposal, just terrific. Wow. And I know it's been difficult to, to, to move through the system, uh, but it's the right thing to do. And it's the right thing to do whether you had money going up or down, I think, in, for the Army. So how's it going? Uh, how's the Hill reacting? What's the receptivity and what do you, do you see this moving forward? You've had, more, you've had much greater success than the Air Force in proposing similar changes in other uh, ways that they operate and with what systems. And um, I, I commend you for that. I think you learned from their mistakes smartly. So how's it going and what do you see for the next 18 months in that regard? Well, this is hard. Um, I appreciate your saying it's the right thing. I, I, right or wrong, and, and I think you could get a debate on, on the right aspect of that. It's a necessary thing, and I'm I'm not sure we would have gotten to it at this point uh, in our in our developmental efforts uh, were it not for the budget constraints. But the reality is, the analysis showed very clearly it could save us 12 billion dollars over the life of the drawdown, and operationally a billion dollars a year. And and uh, we just could not continue to afford uh, propping up the Kiowa. And uh, the Apaches you mentioned before, the Ops and Purse Tempo, our, our uh, aviation brigades, combat aviation brigades, are amongst some of our most hard pressed, <clears throat> and they're first out the door. So we, very reluctantly, but I, but I think, as I said, inescapably, uh, made uh, the decision we made. I, I, and just to be sure, we've had a whole lot of outside analysis. I know AEI's looked at it. We had formal reviews from RAND and from uh, uh, CAPE at OSD, not always our, our uh, highest uh, appraisers. But uh, all of them said, as you did, that uh, you know, the hardness of this aside, it's, it's, it's done well. Uh, and, and we are going forward, and the Guard uh, is, is meeting the requirements. We're somewhat constrained. Uh, by legislative uh, uh, limits, but we're living with those and, and we think uh, we can continue to do that. But we do need to, to execute this. Um, and it's, it's simply, the, the, as I said, the right thing to do. And, and I understand the Guard's uh, you know, concerns, but we've not just tried to take for them, and by the way, the, the vast preponderance of aircraft taken out of the uh, will be taken out of the uh, active component versus the guard, but we we recognize they have a, a vital role as they've demonstrated over the last 14 years uh, operationally, and uh, the concern that I've heard perhaps most often is they they no longer have a combat role in in the air, and that that's just not the case. I mean, if you look at the combat support and combat missions flown in Afghanistan, the vast majority weren't flown by Apaches, they were flown by Blackhawks. And as you know, we're, we're prepared to give them a thousand or so new, some of our most modern Blackhawks. And not only does that maintain their role in combat and, and forward, but it also fulfills an absolutely critical uh, need that they have in their Title 32 missions, their homeland defense, their natural disaster, their state role missions which we, uh, we believe is, is, is central as well. So we, we've tried to do some puts and takes to, to smooth this uh, over. Uh, the Guard uh, continues to be concerned about it. And I, I fully understand that. And from the congressional perspective, we have the Commission on the Future of the Army that's continuing its deliberations. I think it's likely, in fact, I'm, I'm sure, that until the Commission reports back and, and uh, make some recommendations or, or lays out courses of action for the Congress that will we'll kind of stay steady, stay here, and we'll see where that goes. That's a 
great point. I'm glad you brought up the commission. Well, I will say I was out in Death Valley recently, thanks to the U.S. Army. There with the deputy secretary. I've been there for six years. So. <laughs> this was actually at Fort oh, Irwin. No, right. Uh, the other, the West Coast, Death Valley. And uh, for Operation Dragon Spear, the Super Bowl of combat training, as it was called, and it was quite impressive. It yeah. was a joint forcible entry exercise. My understanding is the Army has not done one of those in at least 10, maybe 14 years. 14 years has caused us to focus on one mission. That's right. It was, um, I joked we were seeing the Marine Corps of the Army. It was, uh, it was all of your capabilities and equipment and soldiers that are basically the first to go within 72 hours of a crisis. And it was incredibly impressive. It wasn't just multi-component and combined arms within the Army. It was uh, inner service as well with a, a heavy Air Force presence. It's, it was just, it was truly impressive. And I hope you're successful and make sure you have more Washington people out there yeah. uh, doing well, this. Observing. You know, our new Army operating concept does a couple, I think, very positive things. Focuses on leader development, not trying to predict 20 years in the future, but trying to make sure we have, we have tomorrow's leaders who are comfortable in the unknown, mm -hmm. who can react exactly. rationally. But it also emphasizes the joint force. You know, you, you, in today's era, have to present multiple dilemmas to an enemy. If you're a, a one-trick pony, <laughs> If you've got the best this service or that service, that's great. But if an enemy knows all you've got is a 100 mile an hour fastball, at some time they're going to figure it out and they're going to react to it. So the, the joint force is absolutely essential. And uh, as you saw out in Death Valley, we're, we're trying to return to focusing on that. And it's obviously in the Army's interest, but I, I would argue it's in all the services and the nation's interest because we, we want every branch of our service to be the best and when, if and when the need comes to be able to operate effectively together. And we haven't had the chance for, because of other circumstances to focus on that. So we're trying to return to that uh, kind of basic skill set. Well, I was just, I commend you on also just your outreach and education. Under Secretary Kendall was there, Secretary Work and others. And it's, I think that's so critical for the Army is to expose policymakers and decision makers uh, to seeing the Army in action yeah. and getting them out of their comfort zone here inside the Beltway. So we're going to conclude our remarks and we're going to open up to questions. Please wait for a microphone because we do have cameras here uh, and they will not be able to hear you. And um, we'll call on Rick first, just a good old friend and good friend of the Army as well. Most times. Kenzie properly said that you were a um, public servant, and I think of you as one, because I think of you when you came to Washington as a um, good government guy. I mean, that's what you were here to do. Um, and I have to tell you, quite frankly, after watching you in Congress and you're leaving, you didn't fix Congress. It was pretty dysfunctional when you went, although on your behalf, I'll say it got President worse. President blames me for leaving. Everything went to hell after I left. Right. Right. It did get worse after you left, it did. so I'll agree with that. <laughs> I'll take no other credit nor blame for that. Yeah, I, mean, um, I think that you've tried to do the same thing at the Pentagon, but I would say that you did not um, tame the beast of bureaucracy in the um, Pentagon as much as you might have wanted to do. And so I'm wondering if you could think now and, so, and tell me what you think of your performance. Because you came here to Washington, you're, you, um, you tried hard to make things run. I think that you were a pro-worker, pro-government person at a time when um, I don't think that most of the government is most of your party is um, pro-government and pro-worker. And I'm wondering how you feel about that. The softballs well, I, are over. Rick, Rick. Yeah, I was going to, good to see you again, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember when I worked in Albany as a, as a staffer, uh, the senator I worked for had a cartoon on his, on his uh, refrigerator in his conference room. And, and the caption read simply, when you're up to your ass in alligators, it's sometimes hard to forget that your original intent was to drain the swamp. I, I went to the Pentagon, I think like most senior leaders, both uniform and civilian do, with uh, an agenda. Uh, we wanted to do some dramatic things in, in uh, acquisition. We wanted to take some steps to professionalize and, and provide professional development opportunities to the civilian workforce. And we've made progress there. but. I've admitted previously, it's, it's nowhere near where I kind of notionally hoped we might be. But reality kind of slaps you in the face in these jobs. And certainly from my time as, as secretary, when you walk in and all of a sudden you're in two theaters of war, uh, that pretty much takes up 
the large share of your energy tank. Um, and we have been working hard to meet the realities of both training, manning, and equipping those soldiers to get them forward, hopefully to, to keep them as safe as possible while they're in that theater and get them back safely, but equally to begin to care for their families. You know, one of the first things I found myself doing was taking our family care programs, which were about $600 million, and doubling that share of the budget to $1.2 billion. Um, I felt that was a moral obligation, frankly, but, but the, there's a more basic reality here that, that today's soldier, when they're forward, doesn't need to be, they're always going to worry about their families, but you don't want them worrying about things that they shouldn't have to worry about. So we, we focused upon taking care of, of those families, and now we're seeing such things as PTSD, uh, the aftercare for some pretty uh, significantly wounded soldiers and, and how they go forward, suicides, all of those things kind of say, you, you know, man plans, God laughs. So it would have been nice to, to focus 100% of the efforts on the agenda that we laid out. I, I'd be happy to discuss, I think, the progress we have made in those areas that I kind of outlined. But uh, you got to deal with the wolf closest to the sled, and for us, that's, that's been in a different direction. I guess that's more an excuse than anything else, but it's really the reality that I think I've had to deal with. And, uh, you know, uh, again, it has far less to do with me as secretary or, or any number of stars on anybody's shoulder, but this Army today is the, the greatest land force the world has ever seen, and for all of the very, very bright people in the Pentagon, in my mind, that's for one simple reason. The, the, the young men, particularly, and the young women of this nation uh, continue to step forward, and, and they're incredibly competent, skilled dedicated and amazing patriots and I wish you know you didn't ask me but if I had one wish I wish every American could could see the true heart and nature of what these amazing soldiers did and I had to extend that to, to all the services uh, we're, we're a fortunate country to have volunteers that will come forward and do this amazingly difficult stuff so. Okay. okay so why don't we work um We'll work right to left. Sorry. Hi, sir. Hello, Tom. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Ask me in a minute. Okay. You're, uh, as one of the nation's or the uh, Pentagon's top officials for its bioterror labs, um, can you explain why they've had so much difficulty tracking deadly agents like anthrax and plague, why they're, they've been misplaced, and why you ordered the moratorium 10 days ago? Well, starting with your second question, I ordered the moratorium out of... Uh, a sense of, of extreme caution. And while, as, as I think the uh, CDC and others have stated, that we don't see to this point any threat to, to, to human health and safety, when you're dealing with these kinds of pathogens, uh, I think the better policy is to err on the side of caution. Uh, we continue to examine these. You asked me a question about how this happened. I, I'm not prepared to say that. I mean, we've got some partial answers, um, all of them correctable, but uh, I think uh, we, we want to be very, very sure that we understand as completely as we can the full picture before we come out and, and lay out of a, a way forward. Uh, as you know, uh, part of the moratorium I ordered uh, included all the labs under my executive authority to uh, retrain, to check protocols, to check standards, to make sure that the people uh, in, in various positions had the right uh, skill sets and, and were doing things in the right way. Uh, this all started with a question of, of protocols. Are the scientific basic protocols that you apply against these pathogens to, to make them inactive, are they actually valid? And I don't know as we know the answer to that right now. These are things that are, are very, very complex and challenging. I don't pretend to be an expert in the science behind it, but I, I, I'm going to make darn sure that at least insofar as my responsibility goes, uh, we're, we're taking every step possible to make sure that the public is protected and that we 
develop a way forward that allows us to conduct these tests, which are absolutely essential uh, for the security of this nation and its people in a way that's uh, as safe as humanly possible. Great. We have, um, right here. Thank you, uh, Sebastian Springer with Inside Defense. As, as you conclude your tenure, I'm wondering if you could talk about um, sort of acquisition broadly, but also two very specific portfolios that are, have sort of some unanswered questions in them, uh, the one being the next generation ground combat vehicle and the other uh, being uh, air and missile defense. Sort of where are you leaving things and what's next in each of yeah. those areas? Thank you. It's kind of like writing my own obituary. Um, <laughs> when I first arrived at the Pentagon, as, I, as you heard me say to Rick Mays, um, it was no secret, certainly from my time on Capitol Hill, that Army acquisition was uh, not performing where it needed to be. So one of the first things I did was order a report that later famously became known as Decker-Wagner. Um, I think it's important to note that wasn't a GAO study, it wasn't an OMB study, it wasn't a CBO, it was us looking at us. And while it came in and told us things that separately we knew, it was shocking to see it all in one report. And, and just a piece of the findings from, uh, from 1990 to 2010, 22 failed Army major MDEPs, major developmental programs which cost the taxpayers about $30 billion. Um, you didn't have to be an analyst to know, boy, we have to do better. And so we, we kind of looked at how did we get to that place, and there, there as they are these complex matters, a, a lot of different answers. But a big part of that was the next big shiny thing, immature technologies. Everybody wants something that they think might be available. And the Army had a habit of investing in its developmental programs on, on requirements, on things that were unlikely, and we now know, at least in that period, uh, never did field. And so those programs just weren't uh, able to come forward. So we tried to rein in our requirements programs. I remember that the first uh, iteration of the ground combat vehicle after I arrived, uh, the RFP came out with over a thousand must-haves, telling the, the potential bidder, you've got to give us all of these things. And to, to everybody's credit, we kind of looked at that and said, you know, that doesn't look like a lesson learned to us. It looks like a, a repeated lesson. So we went back and scrubbed that down to, to under 200 uh, of absolutely essential things. We allowed the contractors to kind of trade off requirements against other capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. We understood that sometimes good enough is good enough. And, and we also recognized that the affordable way for us in the future was to build something in a fashion that incrementally, from generation to generation, you could add on to and, and adopt to, and adapt to whatever the, the new uh, realities of the day may be. And I won't tell you we've turned that 180 degrees, but in the last five years, most of our developmental programs uh, were on time and on budget. The reality we've had to deal with Sebastian, as you mentioned, is available monies to continue them, whether it was through an outright budget cut or whether it was because we go into a continuing resolution that doesn't allow you and off, oftentimes to kind of reconfigure your needs within a program. We decided, ground combat vehicle for example, to put that aside. GCV, and, and despite the urban legends to the other, to, to the contrary, that was on time and on budget. It was a performing program, but it became, in the near term, unaffordable. And what we did was kind of put that aside. We are examining technologies and, and, and advancements that were developed to that point to see what we can do to maintain those and pick that back up in 2023 or so, because we, we absolutely need a new generation of, of uh, infantry fighting vehicle and our ground combat vehicle, I should say, and then um, reinvest those savings from what we were going to spend there in our other ground combat fleet, our upgrades, our modernization packages on our Bradleys and, and uh, on our Abrams and, and, and such. And that, that's, again, a political, or excuse me, a, a monetary necessity, not a failing program. So you now the way forward depends on the, the money 
that, that lies ahead of us. And, and we're challenged as well in, in missile defense. Um, when you go and talk to partner nations, one of the first things they ask about are Patriots or THAAD. And I've visited many, many of our folks forward deployed, and they're the most deployed, or certainly amongst the most deployed units uh, in the United States Army. And while we're trying to go with missile segment enhancement and PAC-3, um, that too becomes a money issue. So what you are able to do in large measure in every aspect of, mili of the military is what you're funded to do. So we'll see. All right, quickly we'll go here and we'll work back our way over this way. George. Yeah. Sure, hi, George Nicholson. Hi, George. Global Soft Foundation. You talked about the acquisition and requirements process. Lessons learned. The replacement for the OH-58 helicopter coming out of Vietnam was awarded to Lockheed, and it was the Cheyenne. Built, flown, canceled. Yep. In the next that was in that period, by the way. The next replacement for that was the Comanche, built Comanche. by Bo Boeing and Sikorsky. Built, flown, canceled. In the last two years, then the next replacement was the ARH by Bell. Built, flown, canceled. Have the lessons learned from all of those three been put in uh, uh, to, to the new process that the Army's using? Thank you for digging those up. <laughs> Sadly, I can name others, not, not just in, in the aerial fleet, but uh, uh, you know, in some of our other uh, developmental programs as well. Look, we, I, we didn't sit down and analyze virtually every one of those programs. Uh, I'm sure someone's got that sitting on the shelf somewhere, but by and large, uh, what we have found in terms of our procedures is, as I said, um, an over-reliance on, on undeveloped, immature technologies of unreasonable requirements and always trying to get uh, the very, very best next thing. Kelsey Grammer did a movie called Pentagon Wars. I don't know if you've ever seen it, how the Bradley, not, not exactly historically accurate, but probably not totally uh, unreal in terms of how developmental programs have been approached in the past. I mean, I think in one instance, they were putting a porthole into, into the Bradley. So we're doing better there. I can't tell you, had we done the things now that we uh, failed to do back in the Comanche period, that that would have been fielded. But uh, we found that it's, it's from a pr prescriptive perspective, uh, very beneficial in today's efforts. But again, we're not doing any major developmental programs until the 2020s or beyond. It's one of those proverbial out years. I always said every night when I go to bed, I pray to God that one time he'll let me live in an out year because everything's going to be great in the out years. So we'll see if that comes to fruition. But um, you know, that's a budgetary reality, not a failure of, of our, our development people. So stay tuned. Hi, sir. I'm Jim Hasek from the Atlantic Council. I see. You. I'm going to ask you not about equipment, but about organization, if I could. A um, little we'll backstory. Back in the 1940s, the United States developed nuclear weapons and proliferated them in the 50s around the forces, tactical nuclear weapons, and then Soviets developed nuclear weapons, and the Army thought, we need to reorganize because we're afraid nuclear weapons are going to be coming our way on the battlefield. So the, 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 the plan was something we called the Pentomic Division. And this wasn't well foundly remembered, but it was an attempt, I think, by the Army to deal with, deal with the offset strategy coming back at you. So then in the 70s and 80s, precision weapons. And I think the US military got really good at sending lots of precision weapons towards enemies. And now we're kind of worried, and this is why I think the Deputy Secretary and the Secretary of Defense are talking about a third offset. We're worried about it coming back the other way, hordes of precision weapons coming at American forces, potentially. And this is why you think a lot about missile defense. But if the Army tried, if, if a lot of ground forces thought about tactical nuclear weapons, which didn't really seem to be used, as an organizational challenge, is there an organizational challenge for land forces in the future? Do we need to rethink organization, or do we need to double down on that third offset so that we don't need to? What do you think? Well, uh, look. We've got a lot, a lot of very bright people who think about a lot of different things. And 
you know, the third offset is one of those things that's under discussion now. I, I'm, a, I'm a fundamentalist when it comes to, to warfare because I, what I worry about in third offset is that somehow that denigrates the, uh, the role of land forces. You know, war is a human endeavor. And humans live on land until we you know, sprout wings or develop gills. And so baseline, we're always going to need an army in, in spite of discussions about sanitizing war and fighting it from robots and 30,000 feet. But to, to your point, sure, we're, we, we future cast all of this stuff. And, and for us, that work is done in a variety of sources, not, not the least of which is training and doctrine command. And they look at that, and, and you combine that with uh, the combatant commander O plans. I mean, you know, the way Goldwater Nichols kind of structured us out now is that combatant commanders have their respond, uh, their responsibility, areas of responsibility. They look at the challenges both are supposed to, both today and tomorrow, and how to best address those. So there's that coordination. Um, I can't tell you how that's going to come out right now. Uh, again, we were dealing with more immediate, me day to day are dealing with more immediate administrative and budgetary and political challenges of, of running the Army. Uh, but uh, I don't go to bed at night or I don't stay up at night worrying about we're not thinking about something because we're always thinking about those kinds of things and the, the fact that you're tracking the third offset strategy would show that this is an active, active uh, uh, process. I can't, I just can't tell you how that's going to come out. All right. We'll go to Meredith here, and we'll do probably one more. Hello, Secretary. Hi. Thank you. I'm Meredith Walker. I'm an economist focused on national security and a philanthropist focused on military and veterans initiatives. As our nation's longest serving and perhaps most dedicated Secretary of the Army, you have traveled extensively to meet personally with our men and women who serve in the Army. You've also said that we civilians would be very amazed if we could see our Army in action as you have. Would you please share with us one of the trips that impressed you the most about the men and women who voluntarily choose to put their lives in harm's way and wear the cloth of this nation so that we might be free? Yeah. Um, second service, longest serving. I don't want <laughs> to take credit for stuff. Um, one of my trips to Afghanistan, as in all my trips, they try to go forward to a combat outpost. And on one trip, we went to this little village. We had a combat outpost probably a half a mile away from the actual village. And we went into the outpost, and uh, I met with the command leadership for this whole area a captain and a lieutenant. The lieutenant was about six months out of West Point. And they were it, along with their troops. And they had spent recent weeks clearing their portion of the valley of the Taliban. Anybody that's been to Afghanistan and seen those grape rows, they're, they're like cement walls. Thereafter, doing that military action successfully, they worked with the local shura the supposed elders that I went and met with, and most of them were in their mid-20s, it seemed to me, because many of the older people had been killed off, got them to agree to work with our side, not accept the Taliban out of, out of coercive concern or any other uh, reasons, had developed the local militia, taken these local villagers, uh, and, and taught them how to be an effective militia, all at that level of command. And as I said, normally you'd have a couple of stars running around in, in generations past doing this kind of stuff. And to see those kinds of, of uh, young people, um, as I said, that captain who was a special operator at the time, it, it's just breathtaking. The other thing, the last time I told this story, I broke down a little bit. Uh, we were transiting through Lodge Duel, and uh, we were visiting troops while our crew was getting rested. And uh, the uh, soldier 
had just been brought in. Uh, he had lost one arm. Uh, his other arm was wounded and ma mangled terribly, and one leg. And he was intubated. And uh, they said, you can go in and talk to him, even though he was unconscious. They said, we don't think he'll understand you. So I went in there, and you know, I, I bent over, and I uh, whispered how proud we were of him, and what a great American he was, and uh, pressed a coin uh, into the one hand that he had left. And that soldier, intubated, saluted me. I was just, it's amazing. Almost made it. Well, I, I can't think of a, a better way to end than honoring the, the people you represent, the soldiers that you represent, and their families. Uh, there, there couldn't be any better question or response to which we could conclude our, our day's discussion. So we wish you well, sir, in your Thank next you. endeavor. I know you're not off the job yet as the second longest serving uh, secretary of the Army. You're in it until November 1st or until your successor is confirmed. And, uh, but I want you to know how grateful all of us in this room are for the work that you've been doing toiling away many hours, oh. often not in the public's eye, in this job in particular. So I, I thank Thanks, you. Thanks, It's been an honor. Thank you.